Hello. Thanks for taking time to stop in on one of our pages that enables you to watch this video. I'm very excited about some things coming up and I want you to be aware of them. First of all, on Wednesday nights for the rest of our summer here in the building at seven o'clock, we're going through some leadership principles and I'm very excited this next week because we're gonna start by taking a look at a book written by Kevin Myers. Kevin Myers is a pastor at, at uh, 12 Stone Church down in Atlanta. He's one of, the Wesleyan, uh, one of our Wesleyan pastors. And he's written this book called Home Run. And it's a beautiful book on unpacking the story of Joseph. And there's a pattern that the world lives their lives by. And that pattern is directly proportional to the pattern that God desires for us to live our lives by. And so I'm excited about the, the Wednesday nights for the rest of the summer here, 7 o'clock on location, 1525 South Avenue West. This Tuesday, our church is, is part of uh, several businesses in, in the building that we have here uh, that is sponsoring a, a blood drive. And if you are interested, go to our social media pages and find out the link there that will enable you to sign up and take a spot, one of those slots for donating blood and really giving life to people uh, here in the Missoula area. And one last thing, uh, we have baptisms coming up and there's a change of date and a change of venue uh, for that. August 13th is our new date and we're meeting at McCormick Park here in Missoula. It's a fantastic venue, great river access, and there are all kinds of activities uh, for children and that sort of thing in the park. So August 13th, McCormick Park, and uh, very excited about that. If you are interested in being baptized and haven't yet let me know, uh, please indicate. Uh, you can direct message me on our Facebook page or Instagram, and I'll see that, and then uh, uh, we'll set up a conversation about what it means to be baptized. Very, very excited about that as we head into the fall. We've been looking at three words that help define the culture here at Celebrate Church. These three words are welcome, worship, and word. We looked at welcome two weeks ago, and last week we defined what we mean when we use the word worship. And I've had some very positive feedback from you, and I'm honored that anything I can say would encourage you to seek you and uh, help you in your life uh, with Jesus. There's the story. And I'm sure everyone, uh, as, as we watch this, will be able to relate to Jesus today. The story is found in Matthew chapter 4. If you have a Bible, I would encourage you to turn uh, to Matthew chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible, I would encourage you to download the app Version. It's a Bible app that gives you access to all the different translations. It's a wonderful resource. But Matthew 4, we're going to learn some lessons today. And I believe that some of these lessons might actually be unexpected for you. Matthew chapter 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For forty days and forty nights he fasted, and he became very hungry. During that time the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, No. The Scriptures say, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, If you are the Son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you, and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, the scriptures say, you must not tempt, test the Lord your God. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. 
I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him, for the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And the devil went away, and angels came and took care of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, as we spend time today, not only looking at your word, but the importance of being in your word, I pray that you would help all, including myself, to take this to heart and perhaps establish new priorities, new routines, new habits to give your word proper time in our life. Amen. Let me unpack just the first four verses of what we just read. Verse 1. Verse 1 is huge because it says this, that the Holy Spirit led Jesus to the wilderness. Jesus is all alone. And he's also in a dry and desolate place. Have you ever felt alone? Ever felt like it's you against the world? As if that isn't bad enough, we read, the Bible tells us that the Spirit led Jesus there to be tempted. To go into battle with his arch enemy. Next week, we are beginning a new series on goofy things that Christians say and think. The top of that list is that God doesn't give you more than you can handle, which is unfortunately not true. I face circumstances each week that are difficult and oftentimes feel like more than I can handle. What gives me hope and courage is that God told me, God told me in here, that I will never face those circumstances alone without him. He is always with me. Always. I know that because of two things. First of all, as I said, the Bible tells me that God will never leave me. But I also have experiences in my life, personal experiences where I've felt and experienced his presence in the midst of those very difficult circumstances. Look at verse 2. It says that for 40 days he fasted and then became hungry. That's the word it uses. He became hungry, which I kind of laugh at just a little to myself because I get hungry in between meals, let alone 40 days without eating. It's just incredible that Jesus went 40 days without but Jesus, as you can imagine, is in a place of vulnerability. Which causes me to say this, be self-aware. When you are lonely, when you are coming from a place of need, when circumstances have you in this place, be aware and beware. Because the enemy is aware of those moments as well. Verses 3 and 4. Jesus is going to teach us an incredibly valuable lesson. Where is Jesus? That's right, he's in the wilderness. This may sound a little silly, but there isn't a Chick-fil-A within walking distance. There's no Texas roadhouse anywhere close on the scene. No food or drink in sight. And he is reminded of his lack of resources. So what does Jesus do? When his enemy, which is also our enemy, comes along, Jesus uses the word. The scriptures say. The scriptures say. Would you just say that phrase out loud where you are at? The scriptures say. 
We need to be people who can tell the devil what the Scriptures say. Do you know what the Scriptures say? Are you into God's Word? I hope that after today, your desire increases to be a person who knows what the Scriptures say. So Jesus told the devil, he says these words, and I'm paraphrasing, I don't need what you're selling. People don't live off bread alone. Those are the words that he says. Not this guy. I am fulfilled. I am sustained. I have hope. I am encouraged. I am taken care of by the very word of God. If you remember, as we read through these verses, the same pattern happens two more times. The devil speaks and Jesus responds. The devil speaks, by the way. Listen, by the way, every time the devil speaks, every time it's a lie. Every time. He cannot speak truth. You and I are bombarded daily with lies, all attempts to cause us to believe, if even for a moment, that if we obey God, we are missing out on something. And when the enemy, he's our enemy too, if he can grab our attention, cause us to stop and think, we are headed down a road that is full of disappointments, heartache, and painful experiences. That's the result if you listen to the enemy and give in. So the devil speaks, and then Jesus responds. Pay attention to Jesus, church. Always pay attention to Jesus. Because Jesus does this. The scriptures say, just like Jesus, tell your enemy what the scriptures say. Give your enemy a few verses of the good news of Jesus Christ. Tell him about how much your God loves you, how much he takes care of you, and how he provides for you. How no one encourages you and inspires you like Jesus. How the Holy Spirit's power fills and empowers you. Be like Jesus and tell your enemy what the scriptures say. Unless you don't know. Oh, church, if you don't know what the scriptures say, that's a problem. If you don't know what the scriptures say, how can you find encouragement? How can you find peace? How can you find comfort? How can you understand and know the protection that is yours as a follower of Jesus Christ? How can you understand the power that is available to you as a follower of Jesus Christ if you don't give time and attention to read the scriptures so that you know what the scriptures say? If you don't read, you don't know. And if you don't know, then you're setting yourself up for believing the lies that the enemy is telling you. Those lies, they come at you from every direction. You got social media telling you lies. Like, you need more likes. You need more friends. Everyone else has a life, but you don't. You need more stuff. You need better clothes, newer cars, better vacation spots, which are all lies. You got advertisements on billboards, commercials on your podcasts and Spotify and Hulu, all making you think you're not enough if only you have more. More, more, more. And really the only more you need is a better understanding of what the Scriptures say. Scriptures say, I am a child of God. I'm His. The scriptures say, I'm blessed. I am highly favored, and I am in the protecting care of my Heavenly Father. 
The scriptures have all sorts of promises, all kinds of promises, promises to prosper, promises from God to protect me, to give me comfort, to provide, to forgive my faults, and then to forget my faults and my failures. And the scriptures promise that he is preparing a place for me at this very moment to spend all of eternity with him. The scriptures say that God has promised to never leave me, to never leave me alone, to never leave me without a plan, to never leave me to face life alone, never leave me to face this cruel world or my greatest enemy alone, that he is always with me. That's what the scriptures say. So church, just tell the enemy what the scriptures say. Creation began with the Word. It began with God's Word. And our universe is still expanding. God spoke a Word and created oceans. God's Word formed mountains, the sun, the moon, the stars, and all the amazing galaxies that we continue to discover. We're still discovering them to this day. Read the Scriptures and in doing so discover that the Father has already spoken words over you. There is always a word for you in Scripture. Jesus healed by his words. Most of the healings recorded about Jesus came about by Jesus simply speaking. He spoke a word and people were healed. What healing do you need? The Scriptures say, (laughs) say it, the Scriptures say. I love the story of Lazarus. He's been in the tomb four days. The family is mourning. People had come to give the family their respects. They were crying for Jesus had died. I'm sorry, for Lazarus had died too soon. Their hearts were broken, which only causes me to ask the question, have, has your heart ever been broken? Have you ever been deeply hurt over loss? Maybe the loss of a close friend. And it may have been a death or something much worse, a disagreement, an argument, a beautiful friendship now gone, and you're grieving. Turn to God's Word. The Psalms. The Psalms are filled with beautiful words of encouragement. Or maybe turn to John 11, and you read a story and you come across these words. Jesus wept. (laughs) He gets us. He understands. He knows. Jesus grieved. His heart hurt. Jesus knows what it's like to experience loss. And then he speaks a word, and Lazarus bursts forth from the tomb. The words of Jesus, God's word, they bring life, church. The word of God brings life. They bring hope. They bring courage and encouragement. When you're afraid, well, the scriptures say this in Romans 8.31, If God is for us, who can be against us? The scriptures say in Deuteronomy 31.6 that I am to be strong and courageous. Why? Because God is with me. That's what the scriptures say. I am to be strong and courageous because God is with me. He will never leave me. Never. When life gets overwhelming, the scriptures say in Mark 10, 27, that nothing is impossible. Say the word nothing. Nothing is impossible with God. And the scriptures say in Philippians 4, 13, that I can do all things through Jesus Christ who gives me strength. When life is unclear and it's hard to make a decision, the scriptures say in Proverbs 3, 5, 6, that I am to trust the Lord with all my heart and I am not to lean on my own understanding because when I trust in Him, when I trust in Him with all my heart, He will make my path clear. It'll be clear. When I remove trust in myself and I place that trust in Him, He will make the paths clear. That's what scriptures say. 
The scriptures say in Jeremiah 29, 11, that God has plans for me, plans to give me a hope and a future. Say future and hope, because as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ, you have a future and you have hope. Oh, what do the scriptures say? Because you need to understand what the scriptures say, church. Hmm. First Peter 1, 1 Peter 5, verse 7. This is what the scriptures say, that I am to give God all those things that cause anxiety. That I am to place in the hands of God all the anxiety and all the things that cause me to worry. Why? Because God cares for me. God cares for me. The scriptures say, church, that God cares for me and that you and I should have courage. No matter what might potentially discourage us, we should never be discouraged, but we should have great courage. Not just any kind of courage, great courage, because the scriptures say, oh church, listen up, enemy. The scriptures say that he is for me. He has my back. He walks before me and behind me. God is my shelter, my fortress, my deliverer. Devil, you ain't got anything on me because you can't get to me. I got the Father, I got Jesus, and I got the Holy Spirit on my side. The scriptures say I shouldn't fear or worry or have anxiety. So I'm not picking up what you're handing out. You're going to have to find someone else to purchase your crap, your lousy crap, because the scriptures say I ha- that I have blessings, all the good things, all the amazing things that Jesus has, they are mine. In Ephesians, I'm told that all of the blessings that Jesus has, all of the blessings in the heavenly realms are mine because I belong to him. My hands are full. My mind is convinced. My spirit is empowered. I don't have any room for what you're handing out. Which brings us to the rubber meets the road moment, church. Because nothing I've said matters up to this point if what the scriptures say don't matter to you. You see, last week we looked at worship. Specifically, that worship means to fear God and obey Him. If God isn't your authority, if you allow the voices of your friends to determine how you live your life, then what the Scriptures say really doesn't matter. If your authority is whatever brings you pleasure, if you base the important decisions on how you feel after making those decisions, then what the scriptures say really don't matter to you. By the way, it's a religion. Basing your decisions on how you feel, it's called hedonism. It's a belief system that many people live by. If it feels good, do it. Don't question it. That's what that religion says. If it feels good, then do it. Simply do it and keep doing it. And feelings become the source of authority. And even if the scriptures say something different, you made how you feel your God. And in doing so, you justify your decisions with all kinds of phrases and thoughts, which are nothing more than lies. Thirty-nine books. Thirty-nine books in the Old Testament telling this story. Listen, I'm going to summarize the Old Testament for you. God wanted a people to call his own. He wanted a nation that would love him, and they would prove that love to him by fearing and keeping his commands. And God didn't just give them commands to obey. He said, if you obey these commands and I give you a promise, I will protect you. I will be your God and you will be my people. He said that if they live by his standards, if they made what was important to him important to them, he would bless them, protect them, and no one could ever destroy them as a nation. 
They would be known as the people of God, and all nations would look upon them with respect and honor the God that they worshipped. Well, that worked for a while. But then that nation turned their attention to their neighbors. And they began to desire all kinds of things, and they began to worship created things rather than the one who created them. They worshiped the very thing that the Creator created. Do you see the irony? Worshiping created things rather than the one who is the Creator. And they turned their hearts and they no longer cared about what God cared about. And they no longer cared what the Scriptures said. Families were ruined. Entire generations rebelled against their Creator, who was also God, and they were punished. God hoped the discipline would change their hearts, and for some it did. For others, they only made even more poor choices. Eventually, God would be so disappointed, so angry, because all they cared about was what felt good. If it feel good, feels good, do it. That was how they lived their lives. In sacred things such as loving people like God loves people, thinking about marriage the way God thinks about marriage, honoring God by respecting His name, keeping the Sabbath day holy. We know these things as the Ten Commandments. They could care less, and they chose over and over again to ignore God and what the Scriptures say. This nation would be divided and then it would be defeated and the people of God would lose their nation and they would lose their kingdom until Jesus, <laughs> I'm so, so incredibly, so incredibly grateful for Jesus because he enters and he presents a new opportunity. It's a new opportunity for you and it's a new opportunity for me that the people of God would no longer be defined by genealogy. No, the people of God would be those who willingly choose Jesus, choose to fear God and obey him and make the Bible their source of authority. What the scriptures say, that's what matters to the people of God. Listen, church. Listen, don't miss this. We want to be a place. We want to be a place where everyone is welcome. If the Bible isn't your authority, but you want to see what this Jesus thing is all about, we just want to say these words and we mean them. Welcome. You are both welcome and wanted here in this place. And we want you to see what Jesus is all about. We truly mean that. And we're so glad that you came today. If you've never made a decision, if you never make a decision to follow Jesus, but you can't help but want to be around these amazing people, you are always welcome to be a part of what we are doing. But you need to understand, you are welcome and wanted here. But we worship Jesus. There is a welcome that is extended. But we worship the one who gave his life. We worship the one who cared enough to give his life to us, and we care very deeply about what matters to him. We don't get caught up in politics or the economy or things that are temporary. Oh, we hunt and fish and we ride motorcycles and we love good music, but we worship the one who gave his life. We worship Jesus. And our desire is single-minded. Fear God. Obey him. Our welcome is important. And who we worship is important. And here at Celebrate Church, we have an authority. It guides what we value, what we think is important. It guides how we live our lives. If there is conflict between culture and God's word, the word wins every time. It's the last word. Grace will be extended for sure and always. But grace does not rewrite the boundaries of the standards that we live our 
lives by. The scriptures say is what matters here. Does what Scripture say matter to you? Do you value these precious words? For some, you may need to up your game. You've crowded out time with God and His Word, and it's time to make it a priority. For some, you've never given it a thought to read the Bible. You're missing out on the greatest book that has ever been written, full of life, full of encouraging words and phrases, full of truths that when applied bring incredible and abundant life to you. Church, oh church, make what the scriptures say important to you today. There's a chapter in the Psalms. It's actually the longest chapter in all of the Bible. Psalm 119. It's a psalm about the Word of God. I'm going to end our time today with just a few verses from this psalm. I'm going to begin with verse 1. Joyful are people of integrity who follow the instructions of the Lord. Joyful are those who obey His laws and search for Him with all their hearts. They do not compromise with evil, and they walk only in his paths. You have charged us to keep your commands carefully. Oh, that my actions would consistently reflect your decrees. Then I will not be ashamed when I compare my life with your commands. As I learn your righteous regulations, I will thank you by living as I should. I will obey your decrees. Please, do not give up on me. Let's pray. Words of life. Precious words. Words that bring encouragement and comfort and instruction words carefully written and carefully given so that we might have an understanding of what is required from us and the benefits of following those requirements. God, I pray that you will help me to be a man who follows what the scriptures say. Because there will be times of conflict. There will be times when my eyes are drawn and my heart is drawn to something that is contrary to what the Scriptures say. And it will be a powerful, powerful image that if I will follow that, oh, I'll have all the desires of my heart met. But it's a lie. It's only setting me up for failure and disappointment and heartbreak. And so help me to to be able to have a careful eye for what is lie and what is truth. And help me to be a man who follows after you with all of my heart so that I can experience joy, true joy, that comes as a blessing of following what the Scriptures say. And I pray the same for all those listening. Amen. Thank you for taking time today. If this has stirred questions, stirred things in your heart that you would like to discuss in person, I'd be honored to share time with you. Just leave a message. I'll respond. We'll figure out a time to either meet by phone or in person. And we can just take a look at how God so radically loves you and desires to be in a relationship with you and desires for you to know what the scriptures say 
so that you can benefit and be blessed and live a rich life. Have an incredible day. May God be with you today.